Hello and welcome to Sam's Fans Live on Facebook and YouTube. If you're watching, let us know in the comments by saying hi. Otherwise, we don't know that you're watching. And today, I'm very excited to have this last session of our series, The Power of Stories. This has been a series of live streamed interviews in which I have been chatting with the therapist from the partner institutions that Sam's Fans supports. Particularly, we have been talking about their stories and the stories that have influenced and impacted them. It's been a very, very interesting and uh, fun journey for me to chat with these therapists. And I could not be more grateful for this opportunity. I hope that if you were able to see some of these interviews, that you also got some value out of it. They are on our website, so if you wanted to go back there, you could always do that and see our past interviews. But for this last session, for this last episode of the series, I'll be chatting with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Harmon from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. So Beth, or Dr. Harmon now, who got her PhD recently, has been a music therapist at Cincinnati Children's Hospital for nearly 10 years, focusing on patients undergoing stem cell transplants. Dr. Harmon received her PhD in music therapy from Temple University in 2021, so this year, and she had presented for regional, national, and international audiences. Her research focus is music therapy as it relates to pediatric medical trauma. So I'm gonna bring her up to the stream here in a second. Hello, Beth, how are you? Hello, I'm great, how are you? I'm good, thank you so much for joining us today. I am thrilled for the opportunity. And thank you, Sam's fans. We have some people entering the stream, so let us know in the comments if you're watching. So. But before we jump into the topic of today, I was curious to ask how music therapy at Cincinnati Children's Hospital is looking these days. Uh, we have been in conversations throughout the past year as changes have happened, but can you give us a little bit of an update? Yeah, um, you know, for us, the uh, music therapy is pretty much as it has been back to normal. Um, at the bedside doing the work that we love. Um, you know, in terms of COVID, the biggest change at the moment is we just don't roll around with our carts right now. Um, but aside from that, uh, we are at bedside doing the work. Um, the groups are still occurring um, at our mental health locations. Um, and we are just glad to be able to contribute to children's health in this way. Yeah, well, I'm very glad that that's back to, in a sense, a sense of normal, of normalcy. So I'm very glad about that. So before we jump into our discussion, as we have done in the past few uh, uh, episodes of the series, I would like to maybe start with a story, with a story. So I think you have something prepared. So if you don't mind, I can jump off the stream and let you tell us a story. Is that okay? That's wonderful. All right, I'll see you in a few seconds. Okay. All right, uh, so I'm thrilled to be able to share um, a clinical story that's you know, been fairly recent um, in the last few years for me. Um, and this particular young woman just taught me so much about life. Um, I got to work with her over the course of about a year. Um, and in many different capacities um, during our time working together. Um, you know, we did everything from, you know, music from as diverse as old school Britney Spears to Marilyn Manson, Dolly Parton, everything in between. Um, and one of the things that I loved about being her music therapist was her ability to keep me on my toes. Um, and she appreciated that role so much. Um, so I met this young woman, uh, she was a young adult who um, had had multiply relapsed cancer. She had had treatment at um, some adult hospitals before she um, ended up at Cincinnati Children's. And there's a lot of adjustment which comes from um, being a young adult 
in a children's hospital um, that can be a little tricky um, and not always easy for staff or patients to, um, to navigate. Um, and so when I first met Jessie, which is what we'll call her, it's not her real name, but that's what we'll call her today. Um, I had heard a lot of stories about the, the struggle of adjustment. And um, by the time I met her, I just wasn't sure what to expect. Um, she had a really challenging life previous to her cancer diagnoses. And um, she was just a lot different than a lot of the patients that we had um, that I had treated with music therapy in the past. Um, and I will, I remember our first session together so vividly, um, cause I walked in the door and I just, again, wasn't really sure what to expect. And, you know, I said, hi, I'm Beth. I'm from music. Th Um, and we jumped right in, like there was no introductory period. There was no, um, hesitation with a new person. She just let me in. And, um, the first song that she wanted to sing, um, was a, a really old Britney Spears song. And from her perspective, it's, it's so beautifully narrated her life to that point and how she was feeling in that moment. Um, and she sang that song with me at the top of her lungs. I'm fairly certain the whole unit could hear us. Um, and to just be welcomed into her world um, so fully um, and so quickly was just such a beautiful experience. And that sort of trend continued throughout our time together. Um, and so, like I said, in the intro, I, you know, I worked with her for well over a year. So I'm not going to talk about every detail in every session. Um, but that sort of uh, categorized and conceptualized the first part of our um, of our time together. Um, and um, she was in and out of the hospital, as is common um, uh, with patients with an oncology diagnosis. And um, so the next time she came back in, she was in a little bit of a different place and not in a great place. Um, and so the way that we utilize music really changed. Um, for some of it, uh, you know, her, um, her relationship to music changed a little bit too. It became less of a narration of her, um, of her life and her feelings and became more of an outlet, which was such a real, which is such a um, beautiful thing to explore with her. Uh, and so the days that I would come see her, if she was angry, um, we were going to be in that together. And she was so, um, it was so easy for her to work through her emotions, um, using music that she picked so intentionally that we utilized in therapy. Um, and so for, for Jesse, um, you know, the, one of the most, um, things that sticks out for me during this time was her ability to start in a really deep, dark place. So it's like starting with Marilyn Manson, really dark stuff, and how we could work out of that darkness together, um, still holding space for it, holding room for it, but allowing her to be in a better place when we left. Um, and this one session in particular that started with Marilyn Manson, and I believe ended with Miley Cyrus, um, an old, like Hannah Montana, old Miley Cyrus. Um, so being able to to walk through that together and for her to allow me to accompany her through um, that process of of coming out of her, you know, her darkness for the moment. Um, that's something that always um, really stuck out for me. Um, and then the next part of Jessie's journey was um, when her cancer treatment failed and there was there were no other options. And um, she was really reflective during this time, as one might expect. Um, but she really turned to songwriting in this phase. And that was something she I had always brought to her, um, but not something she was ever um, really interested in. And so 
at one point she finally, I mentioned songwriting and she said, you know, that sounds like a really great way to tell my story. And I brought her a notebook and some paper and it sort of sat there for a little while. Um, and we'd go back to our usual way of doing sessions, you know, working through some, pre some um, of her preferred music and um, using pre-composed music. And, you know, every time I say like, have you, like, are you, how are you thinking about your, your song? She didn't just want so one song, she wanted an album. Um, and so I'd just bring it up to see where she was. And she had sort of gotten a little resistant, which is fine. And I was going to follow her lead. Um, and one of the things that was um, great about my time with Jessie is that she was also um, working with our art therapist, Gina, who um, I know has been on some of these podcasts before. And um, Gina brought up the idea of album art. And for Jessie, that just sparked her fire to want to um, engage in creating her own music. And she created this stunning artwork with Gina. And the next time I came to see her the next day and she had already written two songs in her notebook. She recorded those songs in our session and then wrote two more. Um, all in all, she wrote nine songs um, with very little help and support. Um, and I loved watching her listen to her songs because she was beaming. Um, she was so proud of herself for being able to write songs and they were good. They really were very, very good. And they meant so much to her. Um, and she heard herself reflected in those stories, which she was able to tell me. Um, and that has just been that um, creation that we worked on together. It was really, it was just for her to tell her story. Um, and we were able to accomplish that um, in her time left and that, uh, those songs um, have just really stuck with me um, and her absolute tenacity for life and fearlessness and strength um, really, uh, I think, just will always stay with me. Uh, so I think that's, that's the, the abridged version of my story of Jessie. Oh, bringing her back to the stream. Sorry about that. Hello, yeah, we're back. There we go. Okay, wow, great. thank you, thank you so much for telling that story. That that is quite beautiful, and how you worked with her throughout a whole year. You you said right, mm -hmm. and it seems like you had a lot of meaningful sessions, a lot of meaningful moments. And I mean, writing an album that that is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you for telling us that story. So what, um, what was important for you throughout this whole year in your relationship with this patient, especially looking back now telling this story, what would you say was like a connecting tissue or, or a takeaway or something that really has stuck with you besides this, the songs that you already mentioned? Yeah, so I think, um letting her stay in the driver's seat the whole time and really trying to like keep myself back from jumping in too much because she had incredible resource and capacity. Um, and that was, you know, one of the things I was trying to help her to see was how resilient and um, resourceful she was. And she didn't actually need me to, you know, push her in any direction or to pull things out of her. Like she just, needed a second, if anything. Um, yeah. And I can think of, thinking back of the, you know, those sessions where we were, you know, starting in Marilyn Manson and ending in Miley Cyrus. I did not do that for her. Mm -hmm. I followed her and I allowed her the time to do the work, to do that herself um, yeah. and supported her in that. And so I think that was probably um, one of those, you know, kind of connecting pieces throughout our time together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in many of these sessions, we have talked about this idea of giving the space of how a lot of therapy, not just the creative arts therapies, right, just therapy in general, is about giving the the space so that the patient 
can bring up their natural resources. And you know, at the end of the day, they are the experts in their own story and they have those resources to figure out what it is that they need. So um, I love that creative arts therapies, music therapy, art therapy, give that additional space within the creative framework, right? Mm -hmm. Of saying like, yeah, you're, you're uh, on the driver's seat, you have these resources, but hey, you know, we can do this with music if you want, we can do this with art if you want. And uh, we've, we've talked in the past how sometimes with children, it's easier uh, for them to engage in art as with adults, adults need more of like that permission. I don't know with, with this particular patient um, and, it seemed to me like she was probably like an adolescent, a teenager, right? And she was a young adult. Yeah. Young adult. Okay. So how was it? It seems to me like she was very motivated and very quick to jump into the creative process of like, yeah, let's do this. If I'm yeah, right. Ab absolutely. Yeah. And like that, I think that was my initial hesitance when meeting her. Like I'm, you know, I'm used to, you know, adults need a little bit more of a push when it comes to, how we can, how music therapy or art therapy can work and actively engaging in the art, whether it's um, music or, or um, art. And she had just no inhibitions in regards to music, like would sing at the top of her lungs, like had no shame. And I adored that about her. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really cool. And so I was I was just thinking about some things throughout. I think we we definitely need to talk about this album. That is just, just really cool um, that she took that space and that opportunity to write songs. And I think you mentioned that mainly she wrote those on in her notebook by herself. Mm -hmm. And how was it like with working with you and the music? Did you suggest? Um, particular elements for the music and then she said yes no or how did that how did that process work yeah so I think that was the other thing that was so interesting about Jessie is that her songwriting process wasn't quite like anyone else I had worked with I've been doing this for a long time because um, once Gina got that fire started for her with this album she was just like she she just went um, and I supported her along the way and tried to just put into reality what she wanted. And so for each song, she had sort of a, a style in mind or an artist in mind or even a song in mind um, that she that had the right feel. And so she um, like there one of her songs that was really kind of about her life and was a little bit gritty and um a little bit more painful. There was an Amy Winehouse song. She's like, that has the right vibe. Let's find that vibe. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had a, a keyboard and my guitar um, and I'd start playing some, you know, either a riff or a chord progression. Um, and if she liked it, she'd just start singing um, and we'd just go. And eventually I just turn on the microphone and we just record it. And half of her song she did in one take and we listen back and I'm like, what, you know, do you want to add something? Like we could add percussion. We could add, I could add some harmonies. Like I could, and most of the time she just loved it as it was, which I loved for her. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. Also, yeah, that's very interesting. You know, as a musician, sometimes you're like, you want everything to be perfect and you want to add this at that and like do another take and talk about it and, and so much process, but it's very refreshing to to hear about her just like that that almost raw um, impulse and that initial in in uh, intuition from her and and it was what she got and it was what she liked and it was what she needed and I I think that's perfect that's right really cool. raw yeah. and real were like are two adjectives that could absolutely be used to describe Jesse and you can it's it's so evident in her music. Yeah, um, I feel like that sometimes as a music therapist, I struggle with, you know, our clients perceptions of what they think this is supposed to sound like and the reality mm -hmm. that we're not in a recording studio. And, um, you know, there are some like realities um, of, of creating music in the hospital. And so sometimes you have that balance is kind of hard to help a patient feel excited and empowered and 
proud of their work while also like recognizing like, you know, recording artists are recording artists for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I, Jesse had none of that, which yeah. is beautiful. Yeah. And I think this is also a good example or how to say this. It's, it supports the idea of having a music therapist employed in a, in a hospital. And obviously there's a lot more to it, but like this is very practical, very specific, um, where people who might not know about music therapy might be like, okay, um, you know, why is this the same as putting a, a, a CD for them and letting them listen to some music or why do we need a, an actual music therapist? And it's just, there are so many things that go along with having a music therapist. And this is such a, a valid example of like, okay, this is, you're giving the, the space and the patient is doing most of the work, but you're still putting all your skills as a musician, as a therapist to also bring in, you know, even what you were saying, riffs on the guitar and how do we imitate the style of a certain song and how do we engage with all these musical elements along with the therapeutic objectives for this patient and all these combination of elements. I mean, that's what makes a music therapist, right? And, and it's right. so evident in your example. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. And let's see, I had some other thoughts. Uh, so yeah, at some point you you talked about how you, the sessions were from less of a narration to more of an outlet. And you sort of explained a little bit more about this already, mm -hmm. but I thought that was a very interesting uh, way of putting it, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you could talk more about what would be the difference between having this idea of a narration and, and an outlet. What are the differences there? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think some of it is, is just the way we utilize music. And I think it's really, um, you know, a lot of people use music to um, narrate either their emotional experiences or um, tied to um, previous events. Or, you know, I think for me personally, like, absolutely like music is so helpful in helping me navigate through emotional experiences um and i think you know when i think about the trajectory with jesse i think a lot of that has to do with her comfort with me and um, when you use music as a narration um you know it does require absolutely a certain amount of vulnerability um but you know you're using it's an it's all contained in the song in the narration of the experience and um, you know, she had such a strong relationship with music. She knew um, which songs brought up uh, parts of her story she wanted to tell, um, but it kept it contained in that um, that little part. Whereas, you know, the the outlet using music as an outlet for her, which was a, was a much more raw experience and a less contained experience. And I think she we had built a much stronger therapeutic relationship um, over time and she trusted me and she felt comfortable that a I could I could sit with her in that dark place I wasn't going to immediately say like um no that's not okay we can't we can't go there today I can't sit with you in that um, but we got you know she learned that I could and I would sit with her um, in that heart that dark heavy space and that we would find a way out of it together um, and so, you know, I don't know that that's true for everyone in particular, but I think for Jesse, um, using music as an outlet was a, a far more vulnerable experience for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I understand that. Right. So this, again, just shows the different objectives and paths that music therapy can take, right? And mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And um I was thinking about something else just now. What was it? I forgot. <laughs> well, you know, I think that I, I would definitely invite people watching to also ask questions. Um, I think you've given a lot of food for thought with, with your story. And I think Patty, who um, watches a lot of these live streams, is watching. She's Nikki's mom. So hi, Patty. Uh, Joe Gibbons also is a Sam's fans supporter. So if you're still there, Hello. And um, 
Let me see here. What else did I? Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you think would be relevant to share regarding this story? Uh, something else that, yeah, you would like to explain or talk about? Sure. I mean, I think one of the other things that I loved about just, you know, using music with Jesse is that it also had this, um, uh, all encompassing aspect too, um, that roped in other people of the treatment team. Um, mm -hmm. in particular, she had a milestone birthday while she was with us and, um, she really loved Dolly Parton and the, you know, had a, a huge Dolly Parton themed party, um, including people dressing up like Dolly Parton. And it was just, you know, from, a as her music therapist, it made me really excited to see, you know, A, everybody supporting her love of this, you know, particular yeah. artist who she was super inspired by Dolly, though we never, we rarely use Dolly Parton in our um, sessions, but was just super, um, super inspired by Dolly. Mm -hmm. um, and just, and the creating the album that also brought in a lot of other people to her experience um, from the medical staff and, you know, we did also for a while, she was so motivated to write music that that became her motivation for having to sit up um, at the edge of her bed for PT because she could sing better if she was mm -hmm. sitting up as opposed to laying in her bed. Um, so it also translated to, you know, helping her meet some goals for OT and PT. So, um, you know, especially uh, towards the end of her treatment, just the ability to, for, you know, the, her experience with music to be, um to be uh to connect her to so many others and them to her as well because i think that um she could just describe herself so uh so beautifully um and her yeah. experience so beautifully in music yeah no i love that i love the fact that you said uh, that it, it she brought in or other members of the team also got involved uh, that's also very very good point, and I've experienced it also, and I think every music therapist experienced it, how it can provide these opportunities for the whole team to get involved in in, um, in processes that are not necessarily, you know, that, that do not involve needles and doing all these other medical procedures. So yeah. we have uh, a comment from Joe. Uh, I may have missed this, but could you talk to us about how she chose, well, how you chose this professional path through your education and now your decision to work with highly challenged children and young adolescents in acute care settings? So yeah, yeah. actually that, that usually is one of my questions. Like what is your story? What brought you to music therapy? So um, take it away. Great. Um, I think my path to music therapy is similar to many. Um, I have, a, I come from a musical family. I've been involved in music my whole life. Um, I started off as a vocal performance major and I did that for about a year. And I was just sort of feeling unfulfilled by that path. Um, I loved singing, um, but just singing on stage didn't fill me up. And um, I knew that music education wasn't the right track for me. Um, and so I started thinking about other ways to use music um, in my career. And had I listened to my mother, I would have done this initially, but I didn't. Um, and had to find music therapy on my own. Um, and as soon as I started reading the research, it just was, it was just clear that that was what I was supposed to do. Um, and I transferred schools because um, the place that I was doing my vocal performance major didn't have a music therapy program. So I transferred and the rest is sort of history. Um, and for, as for working in acute care and pediatrics, um, I w it had, had someone asked me when I was 20 if this is what I would be doing now. Um, it would say absolutely not. Um, but I, um, I did my last practicum at Akron Children's Hospital and mm -hmm. I, after my first day, I knew that I didn't want to do anything else for any other reason, that this was, there was just something about the way that music works in the medical environment and the acute care setting in particular just fascinated me. 
and like it, I felt like my soul was on fire. Like I like I found the thing. Um, and I've been doing this for ten years, and that has not changed. Um, yeah. And even now with my doctorate and my research focus, like the it's the exact same. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just think how music works in this particular environment is so beautiful and so compelling. Um, and the variety is incredible too, just how things change quickly and move quickly and how for most things, illness doesn't have a, you know, doesn't have eyes. It doesn't, you know, it's a kind of a, an equalizer. And so there are people from all walks of life all over the world, um, all across the age span. And, um, you know, one of the things that's been super fun in the last couple of years with um, such an incredible diversity of music being freely available on the internet mm -hmm. uh, has the diversity in the music that patients bring to therapy is so fun and interesting. Um, I no longer know what to expect when I walk into a room. When I started, I had a notebook that mm -hmm. had like sections. <laughs> like if you were under five, I had like these songs or um, if you liked country music, I had these songs, like these are on the radio right now. Yeah. Um, and that, that ages me quite a bit, but <laughs> Um, with YouTube and Spotify, like, who knows? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm very happy for you that you found a place that really appeals to you. And like you said, that sets your soul on fire. I really like that. So I'm really, really glad about that. And as a music therapist, I'm really glad that you're also giving back with your research and, and your expertise. So thank you for that. Um, Joe has another interesting question. So do you think that hospitals are moving towards more fully recognizing and supporting music and art therapy? Um, in a lot of ways, I think so. Um, I think at least, you know, I can speak for Cincinnati Children's and I think, you know, we've been really lucky here for the last 15 or so years um, to be um, well recognized by the hospital and supported um, through internal funding um, and being uh, in, and growing, you know, in 15 years, we've grown from a part time music therapist to to a team of almost uh, it'll be nine in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I think that there is um, in, in pediatric hospitals, um, especially there is more of a focus on caring for the whole child and the whole family um also considering things which is you know, the topic of my research which is looking at trauma-informed care and um how to make the medical environment and the things that occur within the medical environment less traumatic and i think music and art therapy have a huge hand um in making that uh the hospital a more humanized and comforting place for healing um, and I think there is a lot of things that suggest we're moving in that direction, at least from where I sit in Cincinnati. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And it's something that we think a lot about at Sam's fans, particularly looking at, well, at a multitude of hospitals. We are in all but one hospital, children's hospital in Ohio and starting to expand to other states now working with a hospital in Florida and for me, you know, it's definitely a big question, like, um, at least in the United States, obviously, you know, internationally, that's a whole other question, but at least in the United States, what is the, the uh, position of music and art therapy within hospitals? Where does funding come from? I mean, we are a nonprofit that supports these therapies and we're external, but uh, what are the resources that hospitals are providing internally, like you said, it's a, it's a lot of questions and at some sense, we obviously believe in supporting this further and we are happily fundraising and, and expanding. But I think that ultimately in order to normalize it and, and make it more global or at least national, then uh, it really needs to come also from the hospitals and then them incorporating it into their budgets. Um, so Joe, again, so he asked, uh, with nine therapists, 
do you find that you have to try and match the right therapist to the individual patient? That's a good, that's an interesting question. That is a really interesting question. Um, so, you know, we do have nine therapists, but we have them across three different campuses. So we have two in our mental health campus, um, one that's in our in-home um, hospice, and then the, the final other six are at for our inpatient unit. Um, and we each cover specific areas um, based on our skill set. Um, so we have, you know, music therapists who specialize more in the NICU, more in um, cardiac and cardiac step down, more in rehab. Um, but what is beautiful about our team and having a diversity among our team is that, you know, when it's clear that a, a different music therapist would be more effective, we have that opportunity. Um, so we don't often do it up front. Um, uh, but like, a, a, you know, I think an, a good example is in certain cultural communities, um, it, you know, thinking so we have a, a large population of patients that come from the Middle East. Um, and if it's a, a young adult female patient, uh, she might need a female therapist. And so we can do that. Um, and but if they, we needed to have a male therapist, we can do that. Um, so we have um, some flexibility if a different or someone with a different style is is needed. Um, I know that's happened, you know, for me a few times. I don't have a like a neurologic music therapy background. Um, and, you know, if I have a patient that comes through that would really benefit from that approach, I'll see if my colleague um, who who is NMT trained can um, can assist. Um, or, you know, it's also been in a couple of situations that we feel like we've really hit a roadblock. Um, with where we are, that especially if the patient and the family are on board, maybe it would be a good opportunity um, to meet a new therapist to try to do something a different way, um, especially if, you know, they have a different skill set than the music therapist that's seeing them currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that flexibility. I think it's important. And I've seen it also when I was in Colombia doing my internship. And yeah, there would be patients that, in particular, I remember one patient who really clicked with the only female therapist in the team and then she only wanted to work with her and we respect that obviously and and we work with it so that the patients get the best possible care that they can mm -hmm. so yeah thank you joe for asking those very interesting questions and she also thanks you beth for your time and thoughtful responses and clear enthusiasm thanks so I think, you know, I, I really would like to maybe have you again at some point in the show to talk about your, uh, your dissertation, your PhD work. I think that's very important and, and interesting. And we could uh, have another chat just about that because there, there's obviously a lot to talk about. But I think we're reaching sort of the end of today. Mm -hmm. um, what would be well i have one last fun question as sure. slightly unrelated but related to the topic of stories so do you have a story and this can be fictional um actually it will be nice if it's fictional like uh, harry potter or i don't know the wizard of oz some kind of story that resonates with you or that has influenced you throughout the years that is such a good question. I have two little kids, so I we read a, I read a lot of children's stories. This is going to sound super strange, um, but um, I have a little boy, so maybe not. But there, so there's a um, a book called Good Night, Good Night Construction Site, um, and one of the things that I love about this book is that it really um, highlights teamwork and how important it is when we all bring our unique skills to um, a given problem. And I have the amazing privilege to be able to lead this team of music therapists and um, and also be a part of you know a lot of interdisciplinary teams. And every time we have, we overcome something big, um, especially when everyone contributes in their own unique and wonderful way, I like can hear the line, the end of the story in my head, um, which is teamwork is why we got it done. Teamwork makes it fast, fast and fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so it's sort of silly and childish, but it also has a lot of resonance um, in in working in healthcare. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, kids' stories are, are the best. Um, we've been talking about that also throughout this series and just talking about how kids resonate with stories. And that's, you know, that's why we have stories in the first place for, for children. But maybe we should do a lot more to, to tell stories to adults and to engage with stories as adults. So thank you for that. Maybe um, for people watching, you can go and, and get that book for yourself and uh, and learn some stories about teamwork. But it's been a very a very great time with you today, Beth. Um, I think I've really, uh, I've learned a lot from you. I hope our audience has also gotten value and enrichment from today. The story that you told really uh, was very touching. And, and we, at least I thank you profusely, profusely for sharing it and for allowing us to have this time with you today. So thank you again. Absolutely, thank you so much. And so this, like I said, this was the last episode of this series. So for anybody watching, I'm gonna put the link on the screen because we have all of these interviews. We have the videos on our website so you can see it there scrolling on on the screen and you can go there and check out all eight videos. So I'm gonna upload this one today or tomorrow. And at least you know you can check out the stories at the beginning of this broadcast. And hopefully you would also have time to listen to, to the rest of it as all of them are very interesting and valuable. But um, I hope you can explore that. I hope you also may consider making a donation so that we may continue to have even more stories. Like I was mentioning, Sam Sense, we're a nonprofit that supports music and art therapy in hospitals. We are in seven hospitals already, but you know, that's one state starting with the second. We got 49 to go. Um, so please consider making a donation there so we can support more stories. And Last thing is that I would also like to invite you to an event we have coming up in Columbus this Sunday at noon, noon to 4 p.m. It's called the Amazing Birthday Adventure. It's a scavenger hunt that's going to happen in a small part of the city. We usually, uh, every year, we would have a birthday party. Usually, it would be like an ice cream party with some music. But this year, we're doing this this um different version and it's gonna be socially distanced we're gonna you know keep everybody safe and there's gonna be pizza ice cream you're gonna get some some goodies so i'm also gonna i'm gonna put that um link on the chat um so that you can also check that out with the adventure all right there it goes and I think that's all I have. So again, thank you so much, Beth, for joining us, for telling us these stories. We really, really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks so much. And thanks, Sam Strands. And thank you, Sam Strands. Till next series, we'll keep you updated about 